tonight on CBC Vancouver News. The train started to move on its own. Runaway train. Investigators reveal more details about the deadly derailment in eastern BC. Plus. Grabbed by the back of the neck, her arm was twisted behind her back. She was slammed into uh, the table. Shocking allegations of harassment and sex assault by Canadian border agents. A CBC News investigation and... What did you wish for this year? Good health, uh, good health. Meals with our family. Gung Hei Fat Choi, we're live in Richmond celebrating Chinese New Year. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. Investigators are releasing more details tonight about yesterday's deadly train derailment near the B.C.-Alberta border. Three CP Rail crew members were killed when 99 freight cars and two locomotives went off the tracks. As the CBC's Briar Stewart reports, investigators say the train had been parked for a shift change when it unexpectedly began to roll away. It's one of the steepest sections of track in North America, and it was here that the train, which was parked, suddenly began rolling forward. It was not anything the crew did to the train started to move on its own. The question now is why. There had just been a crew change. The train was parked and its air brakes were applied when it started moving, quickly gaining speed. The maximum speed limit on this stretch of track is 32 kilometers an hour. Officials say the train was going much faster when 99 grain cars and two locomotives careened off the track and down an embankment. Three CP employees were killed. Conductor Dylan Parody, engineer Andrew Dockerell and Daniel waldenberger Balmer, who was in training. Investigators will be looking at data recorders from the train as well as talking to the crew that was on it before and had parked it on the tracks. Experts say the frigid, wintry weather may also have played a role. It is probably the most challenging territory in all of North America. The winter operating conditions definitely uh, have, are a factor. It uh, changes how uh, the brake systems charge, how now air travels through pipes. Several crews are now at the site trying to piece together the moments leading up to this. I have sent a ministerial observer as well as people from my Winnipeg and Vancouver regional offices. We want to find out exactly what happened. And why what should have been a routine trip through the Rockies went terribly wrong. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. In the wake of the spending scandal at the B.C. Legislature, there are promises tonight of deeper accountability and greater transparency. It started with a joint call from the province's top watchdogs this morning and was answered by the government house leader this afternoon. The CBC's provincial affairs reporter Tanya Fletcher has the latest tonight from Victoria. A joint letter was penned by these oversight bodies, BC's Ombudsperson, the Merit Commissioner, and the Information and Privacy Commissioner. All felt compelled to call for change two weeks after the release of the Speaker's report, shining a spotlight on what's been dubbed a culture of entitlements at the BC Legislature. There are obviously issues related to legislative privilege that need to be addressed. Collectively, the independent officers are making three recommendations to force the Legislative Assembly to fall under freedom of information laws, to broaden whistleblower protection for legislative staff, and to allow independent audits of staffing appointments and dismissals. We think that these changes are uh, timely, uh, that the time has really come for you know, greater transparency and accountability in how the administration parts of the Legislative Assembly uh, operate. Hours later, NDP House Leader Mike Farnworth announced this. These recommendations, I think, are help, very helpful in terms of increasing transparency and openness. And my message is that uh, uh, we're pleased with them and they're going to be implemented. Any FOI changes would likely not involve MLAs, caucuses or constituency offices, but would rather encompass the administrative side of the building. So expense records, travel records, the kinds of things that have been very much in the public domain, those would be subject uh, to freedom of information and access requests by journalists or members of the public. It's not official yet. These changes would still have to be voted on by the Legislative Assembly Management Committee. However, the House leaders from the two other parties suggest they would be inclined to also support the recommendations. Meanwhile, the clerk and sergeant-at-arms are expected to formally respond to the allegations against them by Thursday. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Victoria. Well, we've made leaps and bounds when it comes to tackling trash. But a new report suggests BC has a ways to go if it wants to meet its garbage goals. 
A new Van City report shows the province produces less solid waste per capita than any province besides Nova Scotia, but we're still pushing the limits of our waste management systems. In 2016, Metro Vancouver produced nearly 4 million tons of solid waste, much of it from construction and demolition sites. That's about a mid-sized car's worth car worth of garbage per person, well above the province's target goal of 350 kilograms per capita. Still, there are some bright spots. Cowichan, Nanaimo, and the Capital Regional District are all below that 350 kilogram target. Van City says your best bet is to take the zero waste challenge and track just how much you're actually throwing out and to look for sustainable materials for your home improvement projects such as bamboo, reclaimed wood, or metal. A woman in her 70s was killed when she was hit by a truck this morning in East Vancouver. It happened just after 10 a.m. The woman was crossing East Hastings Street when a red pickup making a left turn from Commercial Drive hit her. A 50-year-old Vancouver man was driving the truck. He stayed at the scene and is cooperating with investigators. Police are asking anyone who saw what happened to contact them. This is the second pedestrian death in Vancouver this year. An Nanaimo RCMP officer has been cleared of any wrongdoing in a deadly crash that killed two drivers last month. It happened after the Mountie tried to stop a white pickup early morning on January 14th. The driver of the truck fled and ended up traveling in the wrong direction on the island highway before colliding head-on with another vehicle. Both drivers were killed in the fiery crash. The Independent Investigations Office has concluded the officer who tried to stop the truck did follow proper procedure throughout the incident. When it became clear the driver was not going to stop, the officer turned off her emergency lights and followed at the speed limit on the correct side of the highway. And Highway 97 is still closed between Peachland and Summerland because of debris from a rock slide, but the government is hoping to have it open and clear by tomorrow afternoon. Reopening of the highway depends on the cleanup progress made today. The route is still closed to vehicle traffic, and so if you are driving, you should take assigned detours instead of following your GPS. This is a major transportation corridor between Kelowna and Penticton, and the long detours have been frustrating for some. All right, Johanna Wagstaff is here now with the first look at the weather, and Joe, it is very cold outside possible temperature records being broken? It's true, Anita, yes. It feels cold, it looks cold, and the numbers are uh, helping us out on that one as well. We are breaking some overnight daily temperature records across the province, including White Rock. Last couple of mornings getting down to uh, close to the minus seven degree mark, breaking a record from 1929. So yes, this is very cold air in place. The edge of that polar vortex, those Arctic outflow winds, pulling that air mass towards the coast, and we are seeing the edge of it across the south coast as well. Uh, wind chills this morning down around minus 30, minus 40 in through the northeast. Uh, this evening, we'll stay around the minus double-digit wind chills for much of the province. It's just high cloud for now, sinking through BC. That high pressure system is helping to keep that Arctic air in place. There is a new weather maker, though, on the move, and we'll talk more about that which may bring a few flakes for Thursday. Right now, we just have the extreme cold warnings in place for the Peace region. This is where wind chills are going to be down uh, close to minus 40 tonight. For us, we're talking wind chills of around minus 13, minus 14 again tomorrow morning. So very different, a very similar feel in the air tomorrow morning. A little bit warmer in the afternoon. It's sunny, though, and I will tell you about the snow in the forecast coming up. Ah, the snow. All right, Joe, thanks very much. <laughs> You're welcome. This weather update is brought to you by your local REMAX agent. The experience, the tools, the know-how. That's the sign of a REMAX agent. Well, it's the biggest celebration of the year in the Chinese community. Yeah, today is the first day of Lunar New Year, and festivities are taking place across the Lower Mainland. Our Leanne Young is in Richmond tonight as they ring in the Year of the Pig. Leanne, what's the mood like out there? 
Well, Anita, if you love the color red, kind of like I do, then this is the place you want to be. From the decorations on the roof to uh, what's being sold behind me, it is just red and gold everywhere you look. Now, we've been here since about early this afternoon, and we are in the middle of a weekday, but you wouldn't know it because there are hundreds of families out here all trying to ring in the new year together. Of course, Richmond is the largest Chinese diaspora outside of Asia. Everyone is here trying to get a taste of what it's like in Asia, where it's loud, it's boisterous, and festivities have been happening since actually yesterday night. The mall was open until midnight here at Aberdeen Center, and they did a big live countdown show, and that continued until this morning, where there were lion dancers that raced through the mall from store to store, bringing in good luck and good fortune, warding off evil. Now, the families I talked to, of course, they are interested in good fortune as well, but they were all at the temple earlier today wishing for something else. Take a listen. Good health. Um, uh, everyone like have make money. <laughs> everyone needs to make money. Um, pretty much it, like just having all the families together and that's all I needed. Yeah. Uh, for good health and family, all the family members are good health. Yeah. Wish, frankly, peace, good health for everybody on this earth. And that's the most important thing I think we need. Peace. And that's it. Yeah. Most important for me. Good health, good fortune, all the things that Lunar New Year is about, and of course, family. And my favorite part of being out here today so far has been seeing all the little kids in their traditional silk embroidered tunics and seeing all of these. Uh, lots of vendors like this throughout the mall. They pack the hallways. And uh, a little bit later in the show, I'm going to come back and explain to you what some of the significance of all of that will be. Anita, Mike, back to you guys. I well, we look forward to that. Thanks, Dan, out in Richmond today. And remember, you can go more in-depth on any of the stories of the day by visiting us at cbc.ca slash bc. And if you are watching us on YouTube or Facebook live streams, you can join in the conversation. Yeah. And you can let us know what you think of this newscast and give us feedback by commenting, like, or sharing, commenting, like, or sharing the live stream. <laughs> liking, you know what I meant. Liking or sharing the live stream. <laughs> <laughs> Divisions over what's causing so many people to be homeless in one small BC town. We'll take you there after the break. If you are watching us online, good evening to you. Nowadays, you can't walk down the street without seeing someone vaping. Yeah, part of that is because there's been a big increase in the number of young people doing it. Well, now federal health officials have announced new measures to try to address the vaping issue. As CBC Health reporter Christine Burak reports, they include a proposal for additional advertising restrictions and a new public education campaign. In response to the rising number of Canadian kids vaping, Health Canada now says it needs to do more to stop the trend. Part of the plan is to ban billboards and advertising in places like gas stations and convenience stores, something provinces like Ontario haven't done yet. Problem is, this entire process could take years. There are some rules already in place. Under vaping laws, the legal age to buy e-cigarettes is 18. But Health Canada has been taking a wait-and-see approach. And it seems the longer they wait, the more kids there are vaping. It's expected Canadian kids will rival U.S. numbers, showing one in five high school students is now vaping. And many are becoming addicted to nicotine, which can harm a developing brain. Vape chemicals can also cause breathing problems. Now the agency wants to place more advertising restrictions on vaping including new limits on the content and the places where e-cigarettes are advertised. For example, they can't be lifestyle-based or advertised next to candy. And limiting the display of vaping products in certain places, much like cigarettes. There will also be a new public education campaign targeting young people. Experts we spoke would say this is all very encouraging. Problem is, the consultation and regulatory process is too long. Tobacco control groups are responding, calling for urgent action, saying a regulatory process could take two years or more, resulting in tens of thousands more kids addicted to nicotine. Instead, MPs could approve an amendment to the Tobacco and Vaping Products Act and skip that lengthy regulatory process. Experts say e-cigarettes were meant to target adults who were already smokers. But studies show kids who vape are more likely to pick up a cigarette, undoing decades of public health warnings about the dangers of smoking. Christine Burak, CBC News, Toronto.
Yeah, a lot of kids out there with vapes. Uh, it, everywhere you everywhere you look. I mean, it is remarkable. It's mm -hmm. just exploded. Mm -hmm. You I know, I, I don't get it. Myself. Even inside a restaurant, I've seen people, you know, kind of sneak a little. In a restaurant. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. Mm. Oh well. These are interesting initiatives because obviously uh, it's uh, a big issue. Mm -hmm. For sure. sure. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll be back with more on what's making headlines across the country in just a few minutes. It's one of the most picturesque cities in our province, but Nelson has a problem, a big one, a homeless problem. In fact, Nelson has the highest homeless rate in B.C., but as the CBC's Justin McElroy discovered, not everyone agrees why. It's a picturesque small town, but it has its share of big city challenges. This week we're in Nelson where a new mayor and council are trying to see what more can be done to help a growing homeless population. Last year, BC did its first province-wide homeless count, with Nelson having the highest percentage of people living on the street. But in a city of just 10,000 people, that's more than a statistic. Some of these people I have known or recognized since I was a child, and I think that that helps people really understand that we need to take a compassionate approach. Brittany Anderson is a new councillor who cares about the homeless community, but knows that in a relatively small town, there's only so much city government can do. There isn't one solution to solve this issue, but I think that we need to keep taking a collaborative approach and bringing in as many organizations as possible. And for a city of this size, Nelson has a large number of nonprofits doing work on the ground, from meals and shelters to counselling, and now the Kootenay's first overdose prevention site. We have a 0% vacancy rate for rental market housing for 2017. Cheryl Dowden oversaw Nelson's homeless count and says the lack of affordable homes and far distance to more affordable towns is a big factor. I think there's a common misperception that homeless people are coming to Nelson to avail themselves of the services. We're finding uh, that the research is just not bearing that out. But the mayor disagrees. It, is it a case where some of the street population is people from those neighboring Absolutely. We know that. The stats clearly indicate that. John Dooley promised to work with businesses on dealing with the homeless issue and says a nuisance bylaw may need to be strengthened to deal with disruptions on the main commercial street. We will, as a community, always offer up that compassion. I understand they got some challenges and I understand their need to be out there. But having said that, I think it's important for them to be respectful to the general public as such. It's harsh rhetoric, but another councillor says part of the reason is that Nelson is still getting used to tackling these issues on such a large scale. But a lot of long-term residents, this is, to them, this is a new thing. And it's kind of a, a reflection of how the culture of the city has been changing, and not for the best. You've uh, lived in Vancouver. Uh, I guess the difference here is you know everyone or yeah. two degrees away from to everyone and so there's that person-to-person -person relationship which yeah. helps increase compassion. It really does. It really does and I think that's one of the reasons why we've been really successful. Our street outreach program has been really good at, at getting to know people. But despite all that compassion and all those nonprofits, homeless population in Nelson does continue to grow meaning that at the end of the day, it might be up to higher levels of government to find solutions, whether it comes from housing, funding, or bylaws. Justin McElroy, CBC News, Nelson. Some shocking accusations tonight against the Canadian Border Services Agency. There have been 1,200 allegations of misconduct against border guards over the past two and a half years. And as the CBC's Diana Swain is finding out, there is no independent oversight. Avec, avec, avec Advocates for undocumented workers block the gates and try to stop a deportation. 
They don't realize border agents have already moved a Montreal woman through a rear fence and put her on a plane back to Guatemala. Elle est en avion. Carrying out deportations is one of the duties of CBSA. But in this case, Lucy Granados was still injured from what she says happened weeks earlier during her arrest at her apartment. I heard a male voice saying, Madame, Madame, Madame. And then the line went dead. Mary um, Foster the, got a the, call the from Granados the morning four border officers arrived. She was grabbed by the back of the neck. Her arm was twisted behind her back. She was slammed into uh, the table and then onto the floor. Reached in Guatemala, Granado says nearly a year later, she still only has partial use of her left arm. They grabbed me like an animal, she says. I don't know why they treated me like that. Montreal doctor Nazila Betash examined Granado's medical file. She had a traumatic injury probably during the time of the arrest, which basically damaged the nerves in her cervical spine and subsequently caused her arm to become paralyzed. At least one officer later claimed in internal reports some force was necessary. Who's right? Well, the CBSA gets to decide that because it's the only major law enforcement body in Canada that still investigates itself. There is no outside oversight. Now, CBC News has obtained documents through an access to information request that provides a rare glimpse at just how often the agency is investigating its own. Between January of 2016 and July of last year, CBSA investigated 1,200 allegations of misconduct against its own staff. Alleged offenses include neglect of duty, criminal association, and excessive use of force. Some specifics alleged in the data, smuggling, accessing confidential information on an ex-girlfriend, even an employee with a hit list of colleagues who'd crossed him. We don't know if anybody was disciplined, if anybody was fired. No. We showed the list to Toronto immigration lawyer Joel Sandala. I hear accounts from clients on a regular basis about treatment at the hands of CBSA officers. But why do you believe outside oversight is necessary? It is difficult for me to imagine another kind of agency in Canada uh, that operates using firearms uh, with the authority to detain, arrest and detain individuals uh, has simply no way to be challenged or questioned in a public way about the uh, conduct that they've engaged in. Better civilian oversight of the For the past three years, the federal government has been Senate promising to bring in oversight. There are some anomalies here in the system uh, that we have to correct. Granados and her supporters aren't waiting. They've decided to file a human rights complaint directly with the United Nations. No. Diana Swain, CBC News, Montreal. The federal government has introduced a bill to protect and promote Indigenous languages. It's a way to strengthen their culture, recognize their identity, their language, uh, and make sure that we're strengthening it for, uh, for years to come. It brings back the pride amongst the young people. It brings back that pride in your, in your nationhood. But a group representing Inuit peoples calls the legislation a symbolic colonial gesture. Experts say dozens of languages are in danger. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says preserving them is critical to Indigenous and Canadian culture. There's no word how much the federal government is spending. An Ontario court heard more painful stories today about lives forever changed by a serial killer who preyed on Toronto's gay community. Bruce MacArthur pleaded guilty to eight counts of first-degree murder. John Lancaster takes us through the powerful and tragic victim impact statements read out loud today. Bruce MacArthur's many victims can no longer be heard, so their loved ones spoke for them today. What I shared with the court this morning was just the far-reaching impacts of the grief and loss and um, the horror that came with uh, the experience of Salim's murder and the indignity that occurred to him, or that was like thrust upon him. One after another, describing the carnage MacArthur has left behind. I was actually surprised uh, that I was able to look up and look in his eyes and he was looking right at me and because I, I didn't know whether he'd be like face up or face down and he looked pretty upset which like of course he's upset but I guess I was shocked by the emotion in his face. He just came to Canada to save his life. 
Paran Ivan Thankoel told the court he spent three months at sea with Karushna Kanagaratnam, both refugees fleeing violence in Sri Lanka, hoping to find peace in Canada. We were powerless people, he told the court, but we felt such joy about arriving in Canada. But Kanagaratnam vanished. His friends were too afraid to report him missing for fear he'd be deported. MacArthur prayed in that vulnerability, say police, just like he did with Dean Lusowick, a homeless man, the court was told, whose mother died, never knowing what happened to him. Andrew Kinsman's sister described teaching him how to swim and ride a bike as a kid. Do not let his death be just a statistic, she told the court. Do something good for someone. Give someone a hug. Most of all, be kind, she said. Other families described being left broken and broke, now relying on food banks after their loved ones were no longer around to help raise their families. Prosecutors urged the court to sentence MacArthur to life in prison with no parole for at least 50 years, essentially ensuring the 67-year-old dies in prison. They described MacArthur as a sexual predator who kept his own cemetery of victims, hiding the remains of his victims in flower planters and a garbage bin, all the while prizing the trinkets he stole from them and relishing in the disturbing photographs showing what he'd done to them. The judge asked MacArthur if he had anything to say for himself, to which he replied, no thank you. He'll come back to this court on Friday for sentencing. After that, it's likely he may never leave prison again. John Lancaster, CBC News, Toronto. We are learning more tonight about that deadly train derailment near the BC Alberta border. Coming up, why investigators say the crew did nothing wrong.
here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. A woman in her 70s has been killed after a truck hit her this morning in East Vancouver. The accident happened just after 10 a.m. The driver stayed at the scene and is cooperating with investigators. The investigation into a deadly train derailment continues. Three crew members died when the Canadian Pacific train they were on left the tracks near Field, B.C. early Monday morning. Now the Transportation Safety Board says the train started moving on its own in the moments before the crash. The CBC's Aaron Collins has the latest on the search for answers. From the air, it looks like a scar on the land, the spot where dozens of rail cars left the track, sliding to a creek bed at the bottom of Cathedral Mountain. On the ground, today started just as yesterday ended. Workers removing mangled rail cars from this valley, while investigators try to determine just what happened here. Preliminary indications are that a loss of control of the train occurred. The Transportation Safety Board says it's too early to say what caused that loss of control, but some details about what happened before the crash are emerging. The train had been stopped on, a, on the grade with the air brakes in emergency for about two hours when the train began to move on its own. There were no handbrakes applied on the train. The TSB says that stop was to make a crew change near the BC-Alberta border. Once the train started moving on its own, it was moving fast, accelerating for about three kilometers before hitting a curve, derailing and tumbling down an embankment to the frigid creek bed below. The winding stretch of track that makes its way through this rugged part of the Rockies has always been a dangerous one, in part because of the steep grade trains have to make their way down on their way into field BC. Another train crashed here last month. No one died in that derailment, but the union representing the dead CP employees says eight rail workers have died in Canada since November 2017, and they want more done to keep them safe, something the federal government says it already does. It's always a possibility that accidents or derailments will happen. We're trying to make it as safe as possible, and uh, uh, we will continue to make that our priority. The cleanup will continue here in the coming days as investigators search for the train's event recorders. Tasks made more difficult by the frigid weather and rugged terrain that may have played a role in this tragedy. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. You are looking at a live shot of BC Place, Science World changing colors there in the background. It's Tuesday evening at 6.31. Today was our coldest morning yet along the south coast. We'll tell you about those temperature records that were set and the possibility of more white stuff in the forecast. Johanna is here next.
Well, this next set of photos may be the best example of just how cold it has been mm -hmm. this week in this province. Check out these pictures taken by Todd Nicholas. He's a BC ferry worker whose ferry froze over this week during the cold. Oh. Oh, what a day. Sunshine, mm. blue skies, Gorgeous snow. Out. Up on the mountains. Up on the mountains, yeah. Where it belongs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever. <laughs> well, we'll see about that once we hit Thursday. Mm. There are some changes in the forecast. But yeah, if you were bundled up, the blue skies and the Gorgeous. crisp North Shore mm -hmm. mountains, it was quite stunning. Let's see uh, how stunning we can get on our time lapse. Ooh, not too shabby. Nice sunrise. Just a few drifting cirrus off in the background. And yeah, the uh, dusting on the North Shore mountains was pretty stunning, even though Wind chills were down around minus 10, minus 13, and you can see temperatures still below zero even as we head into the late morning hours. A very similar next 24 hours as far as temperatures and sky conditions go. We're down to a minus 7 tonight uh, with clear skies, so once again, a very chilly start to your Wednesday. A little bit warmer in the afternoon. I think we'll hit the freezing mark, so a degree or two warmer than where we were at today. Uh, blue skies in the forecast for the next 24 hours, though. There is a system approaching from the northwest, as I mentioned earlier. We'll see a few drifting cirrus to kick off your Wednesday. Most of the cloud, though, should stay locked back across the island uh, Wednesday overnight into Thursday. It's Thursday afternoon that we'll start to see the clouds increase uh, across the lower mainland. But look as I take you through to Wednesday night. Nothing to speak of in as far as clouds or precip goes. And we're losing that outflow a little bit, so not quite as breezy through Abbotsford and Howe Sound. Uh, your wind chills down around where most of Metro Vancouver will be, around minus 15 for tomorrow. High pressure is really the dominating factor, helping to direct that Arctic air down across the south coast and also helping to keep our skies clear. But watch that low pressure system sneaking in from the northwest. It's going to spread some snow through the overnight into uh, northwestern BC. Dees Lake picking up two to five centimeters. We'll see a couple centimeters down towards Prince Rupert. And those flurries will spread inland as we head into Thursday afternoon. So Prince George and Caribou region uh, picking up another uh, five to 10 centimeters as we head into Thursday. But it skirts across the province quite quickly. So I think by Thursday, we're just looking at a few flurries uh, brushing the south coast. There is a chance we may end up with a few bands of snow on the back end for Friday. And I think that's probably our better shot of seeing any sort of snow. So breaking it down, there's a few ups and downs to get through in our long range forecast. But you'll note, even through the course of the seven days, temperatures not getting close to our seasonal of seven for YVR. So this is a cold long range. Zero tomorrow with an overnight a little bit better than where we were at uh, today and where we'll get to tonight. So the overnights do recover slightly. Our overnight average is over three. So again, this is still below. At this point, just looks like a few flurries on Thursday with those bands wrapping around the back end of that low for Friday. This is probably our better chance of seeing any accumulation. I'll keep my eye on Friday. Things could change. At this point, it doesn't look as big an event as Sunday. But as you know, it just takes one uh, little movement of the center of that low for things to change. Clearing out for Saturday, I see another little shot of light snow on Sunday. Clearing out for Monday. And this is the forecast for this foreseeable future. A couple days on, maybe a shot of snow. It is the winter we have not yet had. All right, thanks, Joe. Cold but beautiful sunshine. Exactly. This weather update is brought to you by your local Remax agent. The experience, the tools, the know-how. That's the sign of a Remax agent. Well, spectacle and tradition were on proud display in China today. Yeah, the Spring Festival, of course, marks the first day of the Lunar New Year. <laughs> Following last night's fireworks, the three gods of fortune, prosperity, and longevity were seen walking the streets in the small town of Wuzhen. In Guangzhou City, locals and tourists flocked to a colorful flower expo celebrating the year of the pig. Of course, celebrations are also taking place right here in Metro Vancouver. Mm -hmm. Our Leanne Young is out in Richmond tonight. And Leanne, we mentioned earlier that this is the year of the pig. 
That's right, Anita. It is indeed the year of the pig. Last year, it was the year of the dog, and there are 12 signs in the zodiac. Now, I had a chance to actually speak with Feng Shui Master Sherman Tai. Everybody wants to know, what is my fortune going to be for the year of the pig? And he tells me, just because you're born in the year of the pig doesn't necessarily mean you'll have great luck. So the three signs that uh, are great for this year, the rabbit, horse, and goat, you're probably going to have the best luck of anybody. As for everybody else, here's what he's predicting for uh, the year of the pig. In the first six months, this year will be a very fluctuating, uh, a lot of worries, uncertainty. But in after July in this year, the situation will be improved, and then all the economies uh, and the political situation will be getting more steady and more uh, stable. On there uh, for certainly in, and it uh, sure seems like a lot going on uh, in behind you. There is indeed, Mike. So I've now switched over to a different type of vendor, and I'm actually joined by Joey Kwan. She's from Aberdeen Center. She's been my cultural guide. And so, Joey, now flowers are always a very important part of the Lunar New Year. I always hear my mom talk about Hang Fa Si. So what does that mean? Why are flowers such a significant part of the Lunar New Year? Because uh, Chinese people think that, you know, um, if the flower you bring home, before the Chinese New Year, and it will bloom all the year, and you will be good luck all year round. Okay, we have some of the flowers behind us. Can you tell me, like, what are some of the most popular plants that people are buying? Like, I think the bamboo is very a uh, popular one because it is symbolic, right, for the joy, happiness, and also very important for people working good promotion opportunity. Right, because the bamboo is actually tiered, right? And then it became taller and taller. Taller and taller. We always want that. Bobo goes saying every step is higher, right? Exactly. Okay, there we go. My Chinese isn't so bad. And there's also some more flowers back here. So orchids, I think everybody loves, but they also have a, a special symbolic meaning. Yes, uh, um, it means that blessing and good luck, and also it has a very uh, good relationship, so everyone likes to have an orchid at home. Ah, okay, they're beautiful and they also mean something really great. And you were also telling me one more very popular flower is uh, the kumquat, right? Yes, yeah. the, uh, golden, the golden mandarin tree is the most popular and the um, everyone wants to bring him home with. I think I have one vendor that he's selling more than 200 in the just you know a few day open the fire fair okay well thank you so much for chatting with us thank joey you. back to you guys in the studio leanne young live at aberdeen center in richmond we'll check back near the bottom of the hour thanks leanne you're looking at a live shot from washington dc u.s president donald trump giving his annual state of the union address it's a delayed one due to the government shutdown but trump is Trying to bridge the divide between Democrats and Republicans. We'll tell you what he's had to say so far right after this break.
I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Join Mike Colleen at the SFU Surrey President's Gala on March 1st. Learn about innovative education and research in BC's fastest growing region. And celebrate International Women's Day and get inspired with Gloria Makarenko at West Coast Leafs Equality Breakfast. Get your tickets today. For more on these events, check us out at cbc.ca slash bc. He's called his message choosing greatness. U.S. President Donald Trump is making his pitch to Congress, the country, and the world tonight in his State of the Union address. CBC Stan Burrett has been watching it, and he joins us now live with highlights. Stan. Anita, Mike, the president says, quote, we can break decades of political stalemates, bridge old divisions, heal old wounds, build new coalitions. For him, that includes a trade deal, a border wall, and fighting childhood cancer, among other things. He's urging Republicans and Democrats to pass the new U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade deal to replace NAFTA and says we can rebuild the country with a bipartisan infrastructure package. He also says, quote, we can rebuild trust with a safe legal immigration system that halts the flow of drugs and crime into our country. For him, that means a wall on the southern border with Mexico. But this is a very different political world he enjoyed since he enjoyed last year. This time, Democrats control the House of Representatives. We must reject... The politics of revenge, resistance, and retribution, and embrace the boundless potential of cooperation, compromise, and the common good. The person seated there is Democratic Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, no fan of the president. Trump then touted America's robust economy, claiming he passed a massive tax cut for working families and double child tax benefits. He's also called, ca cautioned that the U.S.'s economy could be hurt by politics and foolish wars. He said if there's going to be peace and legislation, there cannot be war and investigation. Quote, it doesn't work that way, a likely reference to the ongoing Russia investigation. Okay, Dan, and what does Trump say on immigration? Well, a bit more. He's still pushing for the wall, as we mentioned, but no mention of calling a national emergency to get it built, as he's hinted at. Trump received several standing ovations in all of that, and we should say the speech is still going around right now, but he says it is time to get that wall built, and he says he will do it. Still, we're trying to figure out how he will, given that the Democrats now control the House of Representatives. Anita, Mike? Dan, thanks very much for the update. British Prime Minister Theresa May made a rare trip to Northern Ireland today in a bid to reassure its citizens about Brexit. She says she's seeking charges, changes rather, to the divorce deal's so-called Irish backstop. And she's vowing it would never include the return of a hard border with the Irish Republic. Northern Ireland does not have to rely on the Irish government or the European Union to prevent a return to borders of the past. The UK government will not let that happen. May I says will she's not let going to that Brussels happen. Thursday to try to fix the controversial backstop plan, which led to the defeat of the Brexit plan in the British Parliament last month. The UK is slated to leave the European Union March 29th. If the plan isn't passed by then, a hard Brexit would lead to border stops and checks between Northern Ireland and its EU neighbour, the Republic of Ireland. But just the talk of new border checks is reigniting fears of violence in a region that once saw so much bloodshed. Thomas Dagla reports now from Northern Ireland. The first thing to understand about this complicated city is it's got two names. Officially, it's called Londonderry, but many people here call it simply Derry. That avoids any allusion to the British, who many here feel separated this island in two, with the north here part of the UK and the south just a few kilometers away, the Irish Republic, a separate country. And that separation, the frontier between the two countries, is raising all kinds of thorny questions during this Brexit period. All came to a head, came into very sharp focus outside this city's courthouse just a couple of weeks ago when a car bomb went off, the first time the city had seen a car bomb go off in several years. Luckily, no one was hurt, but it brought back difficult memories for Kathleen Gillespie, who lost her husband, killed in an IRA bombing in 1990 during the conflict known as the Troubles. I would not wish anybody to suffer the pain that I suffered, and to see this, this, to even think about it starting up again, 
doesn't bear thinking about. That car bomb attack here in January was claimed by a group calling itself the IRA. They said Brexit had nothing to do with it. But all this talk of a hard Brexit or no deal with the possible reimposition of a hard border between the two countries has dissident Irish Republicans ramping up their rhetoric. Well, I'm pretty sure people within Canada think that the so-called war has ended uh, after the Good Friday Agreement was signed or, or subsequent years, but that's, that's not the case. Fact is, Ireland is still occupied, we are still under British occupation. This city has seen centuries of conflict, and now with the UK leaving the European Union, many here are left wondering what new tensions they'll be left with. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Londonderry, Northern Ireland. To Venezuela now, where Nicolas Maduro has issued a thinly veiled threat to jail Juan Guaido for challenging his position as Venezuela's leader. Many foreign countries, including Canada, back Guaido. But Maduro continues to have strong support in many poor neighborhoods in the cities. The CBC's Adrian Arsenault went to one neighborhood in Caracas today to talk with those loyal to Maduro. So we're in a Caracas barrio right now that is a strong Chavista neighborhood. This is a place that voted overwhelmingly for Nicolas Maduro, and, and the loyalty for him is still strong. It's complicated. Here under Chavez, this community did quite well. There was lots of investment in, in the arts and in the culture. But since 2008, the financial crisis, the drop in oil prices, the presence of Maduro, life has been getting worse, evidenced by what has to happen here every single day with the water. Access to the water is actually getting worse as the city grows. They have to fill it with hoses and then take it all the way up the mountain there. Now, if you keep looking up there, you'll see a, a cable car. That's also a point of discussion here because so much money was invested in that. And yes, it makes the lives of some people better, but others down here say it's just become a magnet of corruption. So it's complicated politically, but what seems to have unified them is what's happened in the last 10 days or so. To a person we spoke with today, they said they strongly back Maduro. They know they have Russia and China's backing and everyone else needs to stay away. One man told us, yes, I've seen the enthusiasm uh, for Guaido on the streets, but that can be explained away as a phase and that every day that goes by, the enthusiasm is dropping. He says that's his view only, but it is absolutely what you hear on state television here every single night. Adrian Arsenault, CBC News, Caracas. And you can see Adrian's full report tonight on The National. And worth mentioning, earlier today, Global Affairs issued a travel advisory for Venezuela recommending Canadians avoid all travel due to the significant level of violent crime and unstable political and economic situations. Now, actor Liam Neeson has a new film out this week, but his press tour has turned into a PR nightmare. Yeah, the New York premiere of A Cold Pursuit was abruptly cancelled today, followed from the actor's comments about thoughts he had decades ago about killing a black person. Tashwana Reed has more. I... I'd never felt this feeling before, which was a primal urge to lash out. Actor Liam Neeson wants to set the record straight. He's not racist. Today, the 66-year-old actor defended himself in an interview with Good Morning America. We all pretend we're all kind of, you know, politically correct. Mm -hmm. I mean, in this country, it's the same in my own country too, you sometimes just scratch the surface and you discover this racism racism and bigotry and it's there his response comes just one day after the actor made a surprising admission neeson says it happened 40 years ago when a close friend revealed she was raped i asked did they, did she know who it was no what color were they she said it was a black person i went up and down areas with a cush hoping I'd be uh, approached by somebody. Neeson revealed he deliberately walked the streets of black neighborhoods with a weapon ready to attack someone. I'm ashamed to say that. And I did it for maybe a week, hoping some black bastard would come out of a pub and have a go at me about something, you know, so that I could kill him. The actor has sparked a Twitter storm of backlash online, with many accusing him of racism. Hollywood director Ava DuVernay shared this tweet. When people ask me what white privilege is, imagine if this was Will Smith. 
while some came to his defense. I believe that Neil, Liam Neeson deserves a medal. You can't blame Liam, Liam Neeson for thinking what he feels. What makes you think you can kill a man? I read it in a crime novel. Neeson's latest film, Cold Pursuit, is a revenge action thriller about a father seeking retribution. With its New York premiere canceled, the big question is how this will impact the box office this weekend. Tashana Reed, CBC News, Toronto. Well, celebrations are ramping up as Chinese New Year is underway. We'll check back in with Lian Young after the break, live from Richmond. And just before we go tonight, let's check back in with our Leanne Young one last time. Yeah, she's down at the Aberdeen Centre in Richmond, where hundreds of people are out celebrating Chinese New Year. What have you got uh, with you now, Leanne? Well, Anita, you know me. I love food, and guess what? This is the, the thing I want to show everybody. So around Chinese New Year, we eat a lot of foods that symbolize things. So radish cake, you know, uh, mochi cake, all of those mean something. And this one is probably one of the most unique of all of them. It is called Dragon's Beard Candy. And this is uh, Chef Cam that we've got here. He actually pulls all of this to create whiskers that look like a dragon's beard. And traditionally, this candy was only served to emperors of China during state banquets, and now he's... Uh, brought it here to Richmond and I'm gonna try a quick piece because it's a uh, pretty interesting I'm gonna take the smallest bite thank you kitty okay it's kind of a messy food it's probably not a great idea to eat on TV last thing <laughs> I want to bring you is the lovely Janice she's how old are you Janice five and what do you want to say to all of our viewers there we go and that's it we're gonna we're gonna take it home on that uh, Anita and Mike I'm gonna bring home a couple pieces of these guys for you Looks yummy. Don't get that show. Thanks, Leah. And we leave you with photographs tonight taken by our Tina Lovegreen. She was at the International Buddhist Temple in Richmond, where thousands went to pray and burn incest to welcome the new year. As is tradition, on the first day of the new year, families visit temples before gathering to celebrate with multi generational banquets. By the way, Enjoy these pictures, and you can always find our news program online at cbc.ca slash bc. Our next local news is right here at 11 o'clock with Dan Burrett after the National.